Welcome to Patients at Risk, a discussion of the dangers that patients face when physicians are replaced with non-physician practitioners. I'm your host and the co-author of the book, Patients at Risk, The Rise of the Nurse Practitioner and Physician Assistant in Healthcare, Dr. Rebecca Bernard. Physicians train for at least 15,000 hours before we are permitted to practice independently. And one of the reasons is because it takes a long time and a lot of patient volume to learn how to recognize emergencies when they occur, especially when they need immediate intervention. Today's guest brings us a perfect example of the importance of this training. It was a Friday. I'd worked that whole day and not done anything super strenuous. The next day, it just kind of really hurt. It was something I knew that this is getting worse throughout the day. It's not getting better. And I kind of opened my fingers. And so I went to the urgent care, explained what was going on, showed her. And I even specifically asked about compartment syndrome. Um, I don't know why. I'd been reading um, some like strange diagnoses and misdiagnoses books. I specifically asked and I was told no, absolutely. There's no way it could be that. What um, is compartment syndrome? Uh, So your your muscles are basically encapsulated in this compartment uh, surrounded by fascia, uh, which is the the covering that sort of surrounds your muscle compartments. And each section of the body has multiple compartments, some more than others. And then when you have sometimes like trauma, broken bone or excessive muscle use, so you could do, I don't know, excessive squats or something where you're doing repetitive motion with a certain set of muscles that muscle then becomes essentially injured, even though you didn't traumatize it with a machine or an injury. Um, And then the muscle itself will start to swell. And because it's sort of locked into a compartment, um, it doesn't have anywhere to go except for it sort of squeezes on itself. Therefore it decreases the blood supply uh, within that compartment. So the little tiny capillaries in your muscles Uh, start to have less and less blood. So that's why then you get the pain first from the swelling, then the decreased color from the the decreased blood flow, then you get um, numbness and tingling. And then because it's affecting the nerves with too much pressure and not enough blood supply, you basically will have ischemia or um, an insult of everything. And that will end with paralysis. Well, it sounds extremely painful. So Karen, you were at the urgent care and you even brought up like, could this be compartment syndrome? And the nurse practitioner was like, absolutely not. What what did she think it was? Uh, She thought it was a sprain. I was like, okay. And she put me in a sling and said, don't use it, have fun. And got me out the door. Um, So she sent you out the door. And then of course it started getting worse. So at a certain point you were like, I got to go to the emergency room. Fortunately, it sounds like you had a really amazing emergency physician, a small town ER doctor. And you said that he actually knew what it was right away. Yeah, he did. As soon as he looked at me, I could just tell like, he even said to you that he had never seen one of these before. And this was like a a doc who was pretty experienced. Yeah. He was was an older doctor. One that's been around a long time. Yeah. I've never seen a case of it in my career. So it sounds like what the ER doctor had to do, number one, suspect compartment syndrome. That's the most important thing. And then number two, start getting on the ball as far as getting you transferred to the appropriate place where they could actually perform that surgery. Um, the doctor had you, your husband actually drive you right over to the hospital because he felt it was going to be faster than yeah. waiting for an ambulance. Cause I guess you're in, are you kind of, how far away are you? We're about two hours. Oh yeah. Um, so by the time they send them from that place to you, it makes sense. So you just got right over there two hours. This is where we always hear about like rural care, but here you had in your small town, this very astute, thank God physician that knew what needed to be done. You got over there and you said that they were so on the ball, like they knew what was going on. They brought you right in and that even the surgery fellow just pushed you right from the bed into the operating room without waiting on nurses or anything. That was kind of the most like unnerving part for me was that I'm sitting here with people that are dying from strokes and heart attacks and um, motor vehicle accidents and things like that. I'm in the same ward as them and I have an ouchy arm, you know, that's what it looks like. Yeah. I think that's actually the hardest thing to teach. And I think is the part that comes with the most experience um, 
I mean, I really just want my interns after their first year to be able to look into a room and, and be like, is this patient sick or not sick? And like, that's it. Like, that's all I expect. And that's just after a year of all they do is seeing patients, right? So I think as you sort of move through training, that's really what you, what you pick up on is even though some people, yeah, you, you can have a bone sticking out of your leg and be bleeding. But I was like, this is your compartment syndrome is more time sensitive than the bone sticking out the leg. Um, so there's definitely experience that comes with understanding the disease process, what's going on and, and why intervening as soon as you can to sort of prevent the long-term sequela and complications is so important. And that understanding who is the one that needs the attention first, that is truly the only thing that can come from experience. And, um, and, and there's nothing other than just doing it and seeing thousands of patients over a course of seven years of training. That's why there's no shortcuts because no. it just takes that amount of time and that volume mm -hmm. until you've seen enough of these and you, and you can do that, or even just to think about something that you may have never seen before, but it's in the back of your mind because at some point you learned about it. <laughs> so it's so hard too, because you in, in our training, there's so much graduated training. So you have like your intern and your junior resident, your senior resident, and then you get to me as the attending. And, and I, I'm there to make sure that everyone is in their appropriate level and doing, doing things appropriately for their level of understanding. And um, it's, it's very interesting to see the different decisions that a first year resident makes versus a fifth year resident. Um, so training matters. 100%. Well, Dr. Saint Singh knows that for sure, because fortunately, although you had to have a couple surgeries and I understand you have a lovely scar, but now you say that you actually were able to get back to work and you delivered a calf and pulled it out, which you weren't sure if you weren't going to be able to do that again. Yeah. Yeah. I was so happy that day because that was, yeah. it makes it all worth it. All those years that Dr. Markle was in training, it's so that she can save someone's arm so that they can save someone's calf. <laughs> I mean, and, and so on and live their best and fullest life. And I want to thank you so much, Karen, for sharing your story, because what you wrote was that you wanted to bring light on the work that is being done in small town emergency rooms across this great country of ours, where we may not have, you know, hand surgeons and all the technology, but you, if you have an astute clinician, a physician with the right training, you can get to the right place to get to the right care, no matter where you are in the country. We're really lucky to have what we do. And we're really lucky that it, you know, it's staffed by physicians and that, that are knowledgeable and care. Well, I thank you so much for speaking out about this, not only to give credit to the hardworking emergency room staff, but also as a warning call to everyone out there to really make sure that there is a physician staffing your emergency room. Uh, that might be something to even look into because increasingly corporations are replacing physicians with non-physician practitioners in an effort to save money. So uh, advocate for yourself, make sure that there is a physician available to take care of you because uh, I always say one day I'm going to look up from a gurney and I want to make sure that there's a doctor there to take care of me. And I think that's what all of us deserve to have. So thank you so much, Dr. Karen St. Singh, Dr. Stephanie Markle for joining me for this really important conversation. If you'd like to learn more about this topic, I encourage you to get the book, Patients at Risk, The Rise of the Nurse Practitioner and Physician Assistant in Healthcare. It's available at amazon.com and at barnesandnoble.com. And if you're a physician and you'd like to learn more about getting involved in our mission, which is to advocate for physician-led care and truth and transparency among healthcare practitioners, please join our group. It's called Physicians for Patient Protection. Our website is physiciansforpatientprotection.org. Thanks so much, and we'll see you on the next podcast.